Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to welcome back IAAP today. We've actually got Sam Evans from IAAP and Glenda Sims, also known as Good Witch, um, from many years on Twitter, um, who is from DQ but is also sat on the, the global leadership of IAAP. Um, both Deborah and I are also engaged in IAAP. We've, I know we've talked about IAAP before. What on earth are you talking about, Neil? IAAP stands for the International Association of Accessibility Professionals. And today we're really talking about uh, the topics around certification. So what does it mean to um, actually, how do you say that you're at a level of, of uh, quality? How do you say that you're at a level of professionalism? How do we measure that, et cetera, and IAAP Part of the mission of that has, uh, the, the organization has been to actually put in place certification. Firstly, the, uh, the CPAC, which was the core competencies in accessibility, and then the Web Accessibility Specialist uh, certification. And there are others underway because accessibility is actually a broad tent. So anyway, I've talked enough. So uh, Sam and Glenda, over to you. Can you introduce yourselves, please? Glenda, go ahead. Sam, you go first. <laughs> Hi, my name is Sam Evans, and I am the certification manager at IAAP. And I come to the accessibility profession uh, through several different uh, professional organizations and then own my own personal experience um, in assistance for low vision and, and blind colleagues and friends for several decades. But my professional background is in professional association management and certification. So I'm, I'm pleased to be able to bring that to help this great community come together and establish their standards and so that we can grow accessibility as a profession across all the industries that we serve. And I'm Glenda the Good Witch Sims. I've been involved in accessibility since the 90s. Um, I had the great fortune of learning accessibility uh, with Dr. John Slayton at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, in 2011, I moved to DQ so that I could work at a company that was solely doing digital accessibility. Um, and throughout my 20 plus years of experience in this field, um, I felt the need for how do we help people in? How do we create more professionals? And how do we help people understand what pieces of the professional package they're missing? Um, because there are very few uh, formal degrees in digital accessibility. And so someone who's self-taught may not even recognize that they're misinterpreting something or that they've missed a whole chunk of things that they need to learn. So I've been pro certification before IWP even existed and very grateful for the professional efforts uh, that IWP has brought forward with the certification program. Thank you. Uh, I, I agree. I, when I found out that there was planning to be an accessibility um, organization, I was very pro joining. Um, we were solicited in the early days and it was like, sign me up. Um, because like you, I've been in, in the industry for a number of decades now. That in itself is quite scary. Um, <laughs> but um, there has been this need to, to for other organizations, we, we see this a lot with our customers, where they want to do accessibility, but they don't really understand it, and they need some kind of quick way and reliable way of measuring knowledge and benchmarking stuff. So, so for me, certification is important because like with any profession, a certification means that you've got a certain level of knowledge, a certain level of capability, which is not the you know the end point. It's the the, the starting point, effectively. Well, it doesn't mean yeah. So it doesn't necessarily mean that that people that don't have it don't have skills, but you know that if someone has the certification, they have a certain level of skills, and that then gives you something that you can work on. And when companies that know very little about the topic are trying to find someone that knows more than them about the topic certifications are a useful way of them finding that person otherwise it's a bit like a needle in the haystack 
So uh, um, I've, I've been very pro certification. I'm particularly interested in the stuff that is happening right now because um, IAAP are trying to uh, create a new certification around procurement. Uh, and um, I'm sure, Sam, you'll give us the, the link shortly. I think it's uh, accessibilityassociation.formstack.com forward slash forms forward slash IAAP underscore procurement JTA survey. We'll post the link because no one's going to remember that. Um, <laughs> but um, it's essentially, if you are interested in procurement and let's face it, actually, you know, money talks. So if you start buying accessible, you're going to make changes in the industry because as more and more people buy accessibly and we need procurement professionals to help us do that, especially in large organizations, then actually it's going to enable us to um, change the landscape of, of the corporation. It's, you know, it's through buying stuff, through companies saying, actually, this is a requirement. And I'm not going to buy this stuff if you don't do this, that, um, that we can change things. Um, but we need to be able to have ways of teaching people in the procurement profession to be able to know what to recognize and what to do and how to write that into RFPs and RFIs and what they need to be looking for, et cetera. So uh, it's, it's really important. I know I've talked enough, so I'm going to hand over to Deborah. <laughs> well, and, and I, I appreciate the comments that you made, Neil, because I totally agree. And I am, I think we're, I know that we're very honored to have Sam. I, I worked with Sam before in her last position, and she impressed me so much. And so I was thrilled when IAAP gobbled her up because she's just really has a brilliant mind. And um, and of course, Glinda, we all love Glinda. She is the good witch of accessibility and she has been a blessing to this industry. So it's really wonderful to have these two amazing women joining us. I also joined uh, all of you in really supporting the creation of IAAP and I wrote a blog about why we needed an accessibility um, professional organization because at the time the industry was sort of fussing with each other trying to decide whether we did or not. But in the United States, it's important to us in a few other ways because what we're finding is that we have these accessibility experts and um, speaking of, not speaking about it from certification, but they say that they're an expert and maybe they're an individual with a disability, which is great. Maybe they're not, maybe they use assistive technologies, but we're finding that the corporations are, they're trying to comply since we're speaking of it from such a compliance tone here in the United States instead of a business opportunity, but that's a whole nother story. But And so what we find is that these companies are paying a lot of money for experts to come in and tell them how to do it. And I had a lawyer contact me from a very large chain of corporations in the United States and quote, they said, we paid an accessibility professional team um, a substantial amount of money and our website is not accessible and we're, we're being sued. And um, I said, well, the first thing you need to do is go back to that accessibility, you know, organization, which was not DQ and, um, you know, ask them why, you know, and so the reality is Have we just lost Deborah? Yes, we have. This would be a moment of inaccessibility. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, no. So, right. no, I actually say that, um, oh, Deborah's back, but I say that we mustn't actually um, mistake um, accessibility for connectivity. True. <laughs> True. This website wasn't, you know, accessible. Actually, it wasn't available. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Deborah, we lost you. Are so, you back? Am I, am I back? Yes. Yes, you are now. No? I am up. That's weird. I didn't know I went away. So anyway, I was just saying that from the United States perspective, a certification has become more and more and more critical. But what we have to make sure that we do, and this will be part of the conversation today, is we have to make sure our corporations adopt this and make the, this part of their IT uh, certification programs that they endorse and uh, include because we're getting in trouble over people not being really knowing what they're doing with accessibility in the United States. So. Uh, but let, let me turn the floor over to uh, Sam. I don't know if you or Glenda want to address that. So um, I hear a lot from people who are interested in learning about accessibility or have been working in accessibility. And um, 
Glenda very kindly offered to 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 write a post about this from her perspective, from kind of the birth of the concept of of accessibility joining together to join ranks, and then the perspectives of the pros and cons of what certification means and why to consider or not to consider, um, especially for those who have been working in accessibility for a lot of years. And so um, I was appreciative of the fact that Linda wanted to take the, the opportunity to, to write her post and that blog. And so, Glenda, I, I think this would be a good chance for you to talk about your perspective historically and what brought you to this point. Yeah, there, and it's really interesting, two angles. Um, I, I like to start out from the, I want to break into the industry because this industry is beautiful. It's meaningful. It, it, you understand the positive impact that you're having on the world and the web. And so I see so many people that want to do this and they're like, how? How do I get started? Um, and one of the first things that I do is I show them what the core competencies uh, study notes are and tell them that this field is very broad and wide. And the beauty of that particular certification from somebody trying to break into the industry is that they realize, oh, okay, so these broad concepts, and then where would I specialize? And I, I go ahead and have that conversation with them as well, too, because I'm always recruiting new people to the field. <laughs> Um, and, and I talked to them about, you know, do you want to become a technical expert? Would you want to do assessments? Um, we have a certification already, the web accessibility specialist, and talk about how native mobile and PDF and on and on. And, but sometimes I'll, I'll come across someone who's like, uh, yeah, I don't want to get near the assessment piece. I, I, if the procurement might be of more interest to me and if they're, uh, the design, if, phase of accessibility. And so I use it as a tool to help people break into the industry. Now, as we look at the intermediate to expert zone, um, it, it is stressful if you've already been in this industry 10 years, five years, 20 years, to know, wait a second, there's a certification. I have to take a test to prove I know what I know. And as Neil said, no, you don't have to take it. But one of the things that I've found is I literally encourage my employees, and I do have over 50 accessibility experts that work with me at DQ, um, I encourage them to take it, no matter how many years they've been in the field, because two things, I want them to understand what's on the exam, validate if they think the exam has good questions, which, had one of my experts come back to me and say they're not good <laughs> um, and to also then help others into the industry once they've taken the exam they have a better understanding and two a one I say what did you think about taking the exam was it worth your time was there a benefit did you learn anything yep every single one of us for, for the most part we are self-taught there are gaps in our knowledge. The core competencies helps reveal that. And my favorite thing, it forever puts to bed the concept of, oh, accessibility? Um, I'm sure I can read a book and learn that this afternoon. Oh, no, you can't. <laughs> it's broader and deeper than that. The most frequent question I receive is, how long do I need to take to study to learn all of this? And uh, that's very different for each individual. And I encourage people to take a moment to go, or a, an hour or two to read through and decide which topics in here do I need to spend more time on? Because it's different for each person. But um, I think, Glenda, I do hear a lot of that of, oh, I should just be able to spend a couple of hours this afternoon or this weekend and I'll be all set. I can mm -hmm. memorize this content. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a lot more about uh, application and implications and and why why it matters to both the, the design component, the implementation and the end user. And so that's a good bit more experiential learning, I think, than memorizing content. And, and one of the things is as we try and explain this to people about the, the profession, um, I don't think they always quite believe us. 
Um, but as I've had people take that exam that might be at a um, manager level, that's not going to ever be technical, or even a sales person uh, take it, they're like, oh my God, I understand so much better just having studied for the exam and and gone through and answered these questions, the respect that they now give us is one that's known from their own mind, as opposed to, I told you, and they just have to believe me. Yeah, I, think that, I, I think that's very valid. Um, I, again, I, when you were talking about the, sort of how much time should I take to know this stuff, a lifetime because actually everything is changing the whole time so accessibility is a really dynamic field so um, everybody's needs are different um, you know people equated accessibility equals works with screen reader equals you know use the keyboard yeah actually it's a, as as you've talked about it's a massively broad field and we're all going to have gaps in our knowledge. There is no way that on earth that any one person can know everything about all the topics on accessibility and all the touch points with all of the other technologies. But it's a great place to learn about new stuff. It's a great opportunity to be engaged with the bleeding edge of technology. It's a great place to be involved in working to make for a better planet, better society. I can think of so many reasons and positive reasons to engage with this industry and be part of this industry. Plus, it's a great career. You know, you know, there's a billion people on the planet with a disability right now. There's going to be more. The population's getting older. The population's growing. That's only going to grow the market share. So, um, again, really well worthwhile. I know Antonio's got a question, but I also want to talk about the piece around growing the skill base. Within our organization, we're committing to putting people through training as well. Uh, we'll be training 10,000 people over the next couple of years on the basics. So um, that's quite a big commitment. Um, you know, not everyone's going to get the full curriculum uh, of stuff and go through um, you know, certification. But that little knowledge is important so that they can understand why we're doing this and then hopefully we'll engage them and they'll want to get certified they'll want to do CPAC and whatever we're also um, we're um, we've run apprenticeships around accessibility for the last five or six years uh, we've had a couple of cohorts and now in the UK what we're doing is we're, we're setting a national apprenticeship standard up for accessibility because what's happened is is that through Business Disability Forum, through IAAP UK chapter, we've realized that there is a massive skill shortage yes. and companies can't recruit um, skilled accessibility people. They can't even recruit not very highly skilled accessibility. There just aren't enough uh, to go around. So many more companies are aware of that they've got to do this stuff and that they need to do this stuff and it's the right thing to do, that there is high demand for people with accessibility skills. So and we don't uh, help by stealing them from each other. We have well, to no, make was, so, not... so yeah. So so what we were seeing was people I I train people up and someone else would take them and we'd take people off them. And that's not growing the industry. So you know, we need to grow the skills base. So 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 we're working with a number of organizations and in the UK there is um there is an apprenticeship scheme and there is a levy, so large companies pay into the levy. So we're actually trying to create the standard so that it becomes a nationally recognized profession as well. So, sorry, they don't call it a profession. I think they call it a, um, oh, what was that? It might be, it's, anyway, it's, um, I can't it's, wait a, to career, it's a recognized career path, career occupation. Path. Occupation is what they call it. So once it becomes an, a recognized occupation, then it's recognized by by government and everything else and it can call it, you know they can take these schemes and they can um and we can work together with other industries so we're working with ability and rnib microsoft large government organizations and partners and and also people we compete with um because we believe that it's worth growing the skill base um and part of that um, will require them to take CPAC and WAS. So uh, at the end of their apprenticeship, they're going to come out with certifications. 
So, um, okay. so hopefully you'll end up with suddenly there'll be a whole lot of IAAP certified people at the end of a couple of years time sat in the UK because we've created uh, an apprenticeship standard that will enable okay. companies to um, to allow people to to work, get paid, and learn at the same time. Antonio, I've hogged the mic again. For uh, Glenda, do you want to say something? No, I'll let Antonio ask the question. <laughs> I think this is this is a, a question that I think you know, uh, that I would like to have uh, the feedback from all of you. I've been reading a lot, um, lately, you know, at the end of the year, a lot of reports on trends, all, all what's going to happen in 2019, and all things like that. So I was reading some uh, information and uh, reports from Forrester and Gardner on customer experience, and there's quite a few interesting points there that organizations um, who have been running customer experience initiatives, they realize that they are not really getting the ROI, the ROI of those initiatives. And they are somehow pulling back and trying to find ways, okay, to get, you know, short-term, preferring short-term revenues to some long-term promises that customer experience was supposed to provide them. So we're you know, here talking about accessibility, and I see that's still a huge disconnection between accessibility and customer experience professionals. So we all talk about customer experience, providing better service to our customers, but then uh, we uh, make a lot of assumptions, we get a lot of personas from a, what we call normal consumer, but how do you, in your opinion, you see that accessibility can actually help customer experience professionals to be more efficient at the same time opening a new vein of opportunities for consumers to, to be able to buy from, from almost everyone. So I, I love the question and I'm going to go back all the way to my University of Texas experience um where it was before i became an accessibility expert and i was actually um went to a, a, read the jacob nielsen book and was doing usability testing uh, at the university and as i expanded my uh, uh, usability testing to include people with disabilities um i was so worried that the usability testing that i was doing for the ut website um, that I would have to provide more time for the people with disabilities because, gosh, you know, a person with a motor disability or relying on a screen reader, it's going to take them longer to do this task, right? Um, no, because we had considered not only a good user experience for a person without a disability, but one with a disability, my people with disabilities actually completed the usability tasks faster. Um, and what we find is, and we're seeing this a lot in the, in the cognitive, is that cognitive disability and usability, the, the difference is if usability is kind of so-so on a site, some people can tolerate it and make it through and make the purchase. But a person with a cognitive disability, or dare I say, a temporary cognitive situation. I haven't had my coffee this morning. I only had four hours sleep last night. Makes all the difference. All of a sudden, it's a brick wall, and it's gone. And these things become so obvious when you test people with disabilities. It's not like, oh, just deal with it. It's like, no, we got to pull this wall down. So it creates a significantly better experience and we see um, uptick in sales and a downtick in maintenance of these sites. Uh, so there's lots of statistics and research that support that. Yeah, COGA okay. or cognitive accessibility is where the money's at. Yeah, it is. yeah absolutely. There, you know, if you really want to um, get a return on investment, it's in cognitive accessibility. You, it is, and I, if you talk to anybody, I, I, we deal so much with people who work in accessibility, but I'm really interested, my background is in marketing, and so my interest is in talking to people who are interested in that reach 
I, I live in Atlanta, so I've grown up with, you know, a soda brand that uh, want, their goal is to get share of stomach. You want to get, if it's somebody's going to choose something to drink, you want to have them choose your product. So um, if you're looking at share of market, why would you automatically want to break out 33% of the market that can't or won't consider your product or your service? And so from ROI, using good universal design thought process from the beginning will eliminate those barriers and include the opportunity for you to reach larger audiences. And so um, I'm interested as well in talking to people who are considering their influence on marketing and sales and outreach to consider the market share, why universal design is important, and how that inclusion in their design and thought process is important for their overall sales, marketing, outreach, and ROI. And along the way, they'll be good corporate citizens by reaching those people who use assistive technologies. And as Glenda said, we don't always, we're not always born with a disability. We can not have our coffee. We could have been in a bike accident while we were out, you know, over the holiday weekend. So uh, there's so many of us that acquire disabilities and um, and age into disabilities as well. So it's it's a lot larger population consideration for people interested in ROI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I would just like to make a comment here. I'm listening to everything you are saying, totally agree with you, but I do think that we need to do a better job in our industry to really grounding this data. And so I, somebody had quoted me on Twitter and they had said, you know, Deborah Rue says in her book, um, you know, 1 billion people according to who, and, and really we know that those numbers are larger than a billion. In the United States, one in four adults identify as having a disability according to the CDC. In the UK, we're seeing one in five, in Canada, we're seeing one in five. So those numbers are a lot, you know, we, we really believe the numbers are gonna be even bigger. But what I wasn't saying, but this person on Twitter was, uh, they, they sort of misinterpreted something. And what they were saying is that all of those people have accessibility issues. Okay, now I wasn't saying that. And I think there's some good points that you were bringing up, Glenda, in that, you know, there's only of the people with disabilities that we're gonna identify under the Americans with Disabilities Act, since we haven't ratified the Convention on the rights of persons with disabilities or the rest of the world, uh, when we're looking at those definitions, not every person with a disability is going to have accessibility issues. And just because you don't have a disability doesn't mean you're not gonna have accessibility issues. So I believe it goes back to what Sam said in that it's universal design is good for business. And so, but I do think sometimes in our industry, the accessibility industry, we, we throw out a lot of information, but we can't really ground it. And it makes corporates, um, a lot of the corporate brands suspicious of what we're saying. I, I've been in meetings where people are saying, you're leaving money on the table and blah, blah, blah. And so I think one thing we have to be very careful with is we have to make sure we're grounding this and really explaining, what are we talking about? What do we mean? And why does it make a difference? I think that we have a lot to prove um, and we ha already have proved a lot in saying, once again, if you're looking at certifications, do we need certifications? Well, um, I know that a lot of people, once again, going back to the point that maybe I made and before I went off air accidentally, was that, you know, there are a lot of lawsuits happening in the United States because people are using accessibility experts and they're not really experts. And so a lot of money's being spent, a lot of money's being spent in the United States on accessibility and we're we're not really getting the return on investment out of that because people, anybody can say I'm an accessibility professional. So I think it's why leaders like Atos under Neil is, are so important and that he's going to commit to training 10,000 employees all over the world to make sure that you know they understand accessibility. So the corporations have to get behind this and understand why there is value to their, their bottom line. But I do think as an industry, we also have to be really careful about providing grounded information. Deborah, so uh, how do you think we can, uh, back to my question, can we better link customer experience and accessibility, knowing at the same time that organizations like Gartner and Forrester, the analysts still struggle to understand it? I know, and I agree with you, Antonio. I think if we don't do that as a society, we're never going to be successful with accessibility. I had I had some I had Judy Human who is amazing on my on my program Human Potential at Work in December, and she said, you know, we're really sort of getting um, 
and I'm putting words in her mouth, but she was saying when we're talking about disability inclusion in the United States, it's only accessibility. And we've got to broaden the topic so it's not just about accessibility. And when she said that, I thought, God, that is such a good point. Just because you do need to focus on accessibility, but disability inclusion is broader and bigger and more complex even, even than accessibility. So then you go back to what you were saying, Antonio, and that the customer experience, which all these brands are desperate for, the customer experience the return on investment, if we really marry those and put it in and say, you really truly want customer experience, you really want return on investment, include accessibility to that customer experience and let's really look at it. I think that's when you're gonna see society starting to change because a lot of the mainstream topics, they're moving on. And I know Neil, Antonio and I, we've been very engaged in the mainstream topic comments, you know, I mean, the topics, the AI ethics and how does it tie to this community? And I think, you know, we've got to broaden it into the mainstream, you know, things. And Glenda, let me turn it over to you. You said you ha you noted that you might have a comment. Yeah, yeah. So um, what, what I think is interesting is that in, in the United States, because there's uh, so much litigation, um, we'll come in and and help a company meet that need and one of the things i see is a fear of oh my god you're going to ruin my design you're going to make this only work for people with disabilities and i'm like oh no i'm not because my mentor dr john slayton had a, a mantra and that was good design is accessible design and back to you, Antonio, when we're looking at what are the metrics? What are we looking for? You know, when I'm brought in because somebody's under, under litigation stress, um, they're not even thinking about ROI, but I am because I don't want to just solve their accessibility problem and ruin their customer experience. And so when I meet with the designers and the developers, what I say is I want you to believe that accessibility has actually made your design better for all your customers, that it made it better. And if you ever feel that you are having to sacrifice design, that you're hurting people without disabilities by making something accessible, you come talk to me because I love those challenges. I won't tolerate them. And when it comes down to the data, what we're looking for is, are we getting more completed transactions? Yes. Are you getting more sales? Are, what's, what's the transaction time? We're looking at efficiency and effectiveness. Um, and I'm just a stickler because that, because that's the way my dad of accessibility, John Slayton, taught me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you completed transactions equals more money. And, and what you're trying to do here is create more successful transactions you want, whether that be a, a, an online store, so you want more shopping baskets completed, or you're a company that's processing stuff. You don't want people failing to make the processes. Or if you're um, a service provider, the last thing you want is for people to call your help desk. Um, I, I used to work in the, in the department that ran all of our help desks, and the, you wouldn't believe how much it costs IT companies for someone to ring their help desk. You know, it's in the tens of dollars per call. Even though they're short calls, the amount of effort that goes into those calls accumulated and the, the data behind it and the metrics and everything else, it's expensive. So every time you stop one of those calls to the to the service desk by enabling someone to complete that transaction, to do the stuff that you want them to do through good design, and we'll just use good design, mm -hmm. then you're saving that company $10 or $8, depending, you know, each company has their own internal cost rates, but you're saving them money. That's a return on investment. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and, and Deborah, you made a point in the chat about, um, you know, data coming from um, the analysts. And I think that the analysts could step up and, and, and do more analysis 
on some of this stuff. I know Forrester and Gartner have written pieces. You know, there was the Forrester reports for Microsoft in 2005 and 2015, I think, around accessibility market size. I know, um, you know, there's Andrew Johnson at Gartner does a great job on talking about accessibility, but actually, you know what? Huge companies make their purchases and decisions based upon the reports of these organizations. And there's not a lot in the reports about accessibility right now, even though it's a big market segment. Debra, I'll back to you because I just- Well, I, 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 no, I totally agree with you. And I would say, I would love to see some real big, you know, analytic, analytical reports done. I would like to see that come through IAAP. <clears throat> now, I, IAAP is, continues to reinvent themselves. They have a new leader, Dr. Christopher Lee, that Sam's working with, and he is a long time in the industry and a visionary. I totally, totally, I was so excited to see him get that leadership. But I think the opportunity we have is for it to come from the accessibility. And I know that IAAP is really trying to broaden the I, the international. It's not just about the U.S. This is global. And so well, there's still a lot of work to do. Neil, there's still a lot of work to do. But they are aware that this, these have to be global conversations. I know, you know. Anyway, I'm not going to stop making faces at me, Neil. Um, but what I would like to see happen, just in my humble opinion, I'd like to see IAAP be funded with a really large research grant. And I would like to see IAAP reaching out to universities and to analysts in the industry and, you know, corporations like DQ that are playing leadership roles and others, not just, just so that it's only about IAAP, because this is not, this is about the accessibility profession and about really a game changer for customer experience, as Antonio said. But I'd like to see more corporate brands get engaged in this to make sure that we are having really grounded information, grounded numbers. And right now, there's still not good numbers. And I still see people at conferences saying, well, the United States has $220 billion of discretionary income, which we were saying in the 90s, and I don't know where we got it then, when we've had financial crisis and Anyway, I won't go into politics, but so I think that we have an opportunity to get more of this data grounded. I, I think that the points that Glenda was making, they're so brilliant because the reality is when you make a site accessible, it's going to improve the design. It's going to improve the experience for everyone. When Glenda, you were talking about, I haven't had my coffee. Well, I have a, a good, my producer, Doug Forrest of my show, He's, a, he's two babies at home, and one of the babies didn't want to sleep. So this yeah. man and his wife have been going for months on sleep deprivation, and I know he's struggling with accessibility. So and it's good for all of us. And, and what's, ahead, Glenda. Beautiful, what's beautiful about accessibility is when you change it from a stick to a carrot. When, when you understand, and, and don't get me wrong, if, if you're under a dire situation and, and you need our help, I'm there, you know, we want to help you, but I don't want to come in and just look at the stick. I want to turn that around and the beauty of accessibility with the right lens of good design is testing successfully with people with disability will highlight the things that are harder to find that need to be fixed for usability if you don't test with people with disabilities. And so you're gonna find it faster. You're gonna find the problems faster. And um, so it's good for business. Excellent. Absolutely. So, so let's um, talk I about the procurement. Yeah. yeah, I know we're almost out of time, but let's talk about the procurement. Yeah. So we are, undertaking um, another certification program to work on procurement of accessible ICT, so procurement of accessible information communication technologies. And the goal is to establish what are the core skills, activities, and knowledge that an intermediate person working in a procurement role would need to know to be able to engage and successfully contribute to accessible procurement of ICT. So uh, we understand that, that the procurement specialist is contracts and, and support, and they're going to interact with other specialists in their organization who have the IT knowledge and the accessibility knowledge 
but working on what are the core skills, knowledge, and information about accessibility at its core and about accessible ICT that a procurement specialist needs to be successful in support of their organization. Yeah. And that's going to be based on um, uh, 508 requirements in the US and the EN mandates in the European uh, Union, and then also in private industry that work in lots of different various um, areas of, of regulation and support and guidance. And remember, the 508 have been modeled after the W3 WCAG, so with, that's included in there, too, for anyone that doesn't know U.S. law. But uh, I'll just make one little comment and then turn it over to Neil. But one thing that we, we um, as I was working, you know, with accessibility with customers in the past, one thing I would say to them, do it as part of your procurement. If, if you're making sure that everything you're procuring is accessible, you're going to take so much risk away from yourself. Push it to your vendors. And the government of the United States, that's what they've tried to do. They haven't done it successfully across the board, but Europe has done a really good job. UK is always better than us. But um, so doing it at the procurement, I think is going to solve so many problems and it, it pushes it on the people that are making the products and the services and the tools, which I think makes so much sense. So Neil, I'll, I'll be quiet and turn it over to you. Oh, no, so, no I, I agree. I think procurement uh, has a huge role to play uh, in changing the the economic landscape of, of accessibility. Uh, it, it, I think that procurement professionals need the advice as to what to look for. Um, and, and, and likewise, the accessibility profession needs to understand how procurement works as well, how those, how the mechanics of buying and RFPs and procurement systems work, because it's complex and also the balance because that, that's the other thing when you're doing an RFP and an RFQ you know accessibility is only part of the, the 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 characteristics you may end up with laws that conflict you may be legally obliged to um, meet GDPR and data protection regulations you know you may you may actually have to have a waiting because the laws that require you to keep data private, require you know, are pointing towards one product, and the, the other one may be more accessible, but not as good on data uh, data protection and stuff like that. So there are all of these considerations that we need to take into play. So I think it's really important that we build up this kind of as as IAAP has done with other stuff, a body of knowledge as to what it is that people need to know, and then to be able to certify people against it. So um, thank you very much for coming on today. It's been great. Um, just need to thank uh, Barclays and My Clear Text for their support as always. Oh, Glenda, do you want to close for us? You know what? We might handle it in the in the Twitter chat later. Um, I was just going to say procurement is a gorgeous topic. It can be overwhelming, um, but it is it, instead of developing accessible, buying accessible, and realize that as a world. If we handle the vendor that's right in front of us at the time, we're making an impact. So you don't have to handle all the vendors when it's right in front of you right now. Yeah, no, okay. And Antonio in the comments just says there's a lot in common. And actually, he's right because you know what? If you're making a product or buying a product, it's all in the specifications. And I'm going to leave you on that thought. Thank you very much.